right, welcome to Discovery Church. For those of you joining us online, so glad you're with us. Or out door in our courtyard, especially our Discovery Northwest Campus meeting at Centennial High School. I love you guys. Give it up wherever you're at if you're happy to be in the house of God and listening today. Man, I'm so excited to jump into the Word with you, begin a brand new series. Let me kind of start by just kind of stating probably the obvious. We're living in a crazy world. I mean, you agree with this, okay? The world is going haywire. I don't know if you're like me, but you see things and you hear things like on the news or on media or, or on, you know, in our school system or, or in these, these television programs and stuff, and you think there's, so, there's something wrong at a deeper level. Like something's like, like, like it almost seems like the concerted effort to distort, deceive, divide, and confuse. Am I alone? Do you see this, you guys? See some things that are like, something's not right about what's happening. Your discernment just kind of rages up and goes, well, something's not right about this. Or maybe you've kind of felt like you want to do the right thing and you want to say the right thing but you end up always going or going in the wrong direction. Like maybe you struggle with your emotions or your habits, or maybe there's negative traits in your parents that kind of you are in your household that became part of your identity. Or maybe the same struggles they had, like dealing with the same things, the same demons they struggle with, you're struggling with those issues of lack or loneliness. Or maybe you carry the scars of your childhood, like those, the, the wounds, the rejection, the abandonment, the bitterness. If any of that stuff sounds familiar, my hope, in the message today and in this series of teaching that we're beginning is to make sense of your struggles, that there is a reality happening, that there is a spiritual war. There's a spiritual war taking place. Today we begin a series called The Art of War, The Essentials to Spiritual Warfare. Now there's a lot of confusion surrounding this topic and there's a lot of fear around this topic as well. And what's that, what that's done to some of us is some of you have acted like it's just not happening. You chose to just be like, okay, just not even think about it. Let me just pretend it's not there or act like it's not there. So you bring a lot of physical or tangible solutions to a lot of the earthly problems you experience. But the problem with that approach is the physical solutions alone cannot fix spiritual problems. Come on, are you all with me today? Okay. Now, now we need to address the physical problems absolutely absolutely but you will never be free indeed until you solve the source of your struggles and my hope today is by making you aware of it you'll stop being a casualty of war and start getting victory over your enemy can i get an amen somebody so let me say it like this if you're not in the battle you're in bondage you might not like that but the real you might not like to hear that but but because you think like ignorance is bliss but the reality is ignorance is blinding so whether by ignorance or indifference or comfort or, or complacency, if you're not battling it, I'm telling you that there are areas of your emotions and your minds and your habits and your relationships that are, are in a degree of bondage. And as we start to get older and a little bit more mature and maybe get like married and start having kids, it's almost like we intuitively know that we need to get our act together. Any parents know what I'm talking about or something? Usually moms feel this earlier like when the baby's in the womb dads take a lot longer and stuff but a lot of times moms in the womb feel like oh my gosh i just gotta we almost intuitively know that and i talk to parents all the time like like here at church they're coming to church because they got little kids they're, oh my gosh we got these little kids now i just feel like we need to get in church you know why it's like we intuitively know the reality that whatever doesn't get transformed gets transmitted to the next generation and you know this because you inherited some things that you didn't ask for from your parents. And until someone breaks that stronghold and, and chooses to, to, to just end it, it you, will, you will continue to pass down generational curses instead of generational blessings. You will pass down divorce and, and illness and anger and bitterness. And we know this intuitively, even those of you that don't even really believe in Jesus here today or even know the Bible, you know this, you sense this. You know why? Because you're a spiritual being, not just a physical person. And it's so important to understand something else, though, as we study the essentials of spiritual warfare. And that is, you can't beg God to heal you and stay loyal to what's killing you. You can't beg God to heal you and stay loyal to your addiction and to your habits and to the very things that are robbing and stealing and destroying. I'm going to show you the reality of the war and give you some tools for victory, but more than just information and, and Bible study today, you're going to have to participate in faith if you want freedom and healing. Now, now, 
in this first installment of the series, I need to I need to teach the Word of God. A lot of times I like to preach. You know, I got to preach, but today I need to teach, man. Y'all okay if I get teachy with you? I got to dig into the Word of God here. I'm going to take you to school. Like, it's class. Class is in session. We're going to, the, 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 the title of today's message is Spiritual Warfare 101, okay? So we just need to, we need to understand and become aware of some things. So I got to dig into the Word of God because there's so much the Bible has to say about the topic of spiritual warfare. I don't know if you realize that Old Testament New Testament, it's all over the place. So I got notes packed for the first time ever. I got like two pages of handouts. So so, uh, let's go, okay? How many all ready to get into the word of God today, okay? Okay, let me start right here in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, where Jesus is speaking. It says, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So listen, Satan is not a symbol of evil as some Christians actually believe. He's not a metaphor. He's not just a nasty person in a red jumpsuit holding a pitchfork or something like that. That's, he's not a cosmic force. He's a person. Or better yet, he's an angel. He's an angel that existed in heaven. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. I saw him, that, that Satan, be, he fell like lightning from heaven. And then he says this, I give you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Now check this line out. He says, nothing will harm you. Come on, somebody believe that. I need you to believe that today. Because some of you think that studying this or understanding this or getting too close to this, oh, the devil's powerful. You need to hear the word of God today. Nothing will harm you. Nothing, Jesus says, will harm you. You need to pick up faith. If you think that by studying and knowing the truth of God's word about this, that somehow you're opening yourself up to a, to a higher power and force over you, then you are battling without a shield. The shield is the shield of faith. What is faith? Faith in what Jesus says in his word. He says, nothing will harm me, but you got to put it on. However, however, do not rejoice that those spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So Jesus tells us that he saw Satan cast out of heaven uh, like lightning, he says. I believe, and a lot of scholars believe, that that event actually takes place between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-1. Two, because there's a punctuation mark that signifies a gap between those. So Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and there's a gap. And then verse 2 comes, and then it says the earth was formless and void. Now, obviously, something happened to create formless and a void because God never creates anything without purpose. So something happened, destruction happened on the earth, and most people believe an event took place, this event, and it's actually recorded twice in the Old Testament. If you want to study it later for extra notes, that event uh, between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2 that we read about, Satan being cast out, happened in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. The Bible records a time where Satan kind of said, hey, you know, I'm leading all this worship for you, God, and all these angels are worshiping you, but I kind of would like to be the one to receive worship now. And, and the Bible says when that pride was found in his heart, uh, God said, I don't think so, buddy, and cast him out immediately. Okay, out of it. And G- Jesus saw this. He says, I saw it. I saw Satan fall when, when, when Father decided to deal with it like lightning from it. And then the book of Revelation records it yet again in another place, Revelation chapter 12. It says, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels. Michael's one of the three angels that are actually named in scriptures. Ain't Michael Gabriel or archangels, and Lucifer is the other angel that's named, which is actually Satan. That's his angelic name uh, before he was cast out of heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But, and I had to highlight this because I started shouting right in my study, but he was not strong enough. Come on, somebody, I'm telling you. He lies to you to make you think he is stronger, but he's not strong enough. If you're a believer in Christ, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And then he says this, and they lost their place in heaven. The they he's talking about is the angels that were foolish enough to follow Satan. Okay, the Bible says a third of the angels followed him and were cast out of heaven, and they now have become the demons who are operating the spiritual realm. They lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the world astray. I want you to notice this detail. He was hurled down to the what? To the earth. So out of heaven and into this domain or into this realm, 
and his angels or his demons with him. And that's what I need you to know. The Bible says that's where he's operating right now. That's perhaps why the earth became formless and void between in Genesis 1-2. That's perhaps why uh, he's, he's causing havoc in your life. He wants to create a Genesis 1-2 experience where he's creating a formless void in your life. This is what the enemy does. He tries to come in. He's against you to steal, to kill, to destroy. These aren't in your notes, but you may want to jot these down. I put four different places in the Bible. You can put all four of them up right now. Four different places where it talks about where the enemy is operating right now. John chapter 12, verse 31, calls him the ruler of this world that we're living in. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says he is the God of this age, the little G God of this age, not the big G. He ain't the big G, you guys. He's the little G, the little G God of this age. Ephesians 2, 2 says he is the prince of the power of the air. 1 John 5, 19 says the whole world that we're living in lies under the, the sway of the wicked one. So I got a lot to cover with you guys today, man. There are some things that we just need to, as we go on this journey, you guys, and I hope you go on this journey with me over the next four weeks. We're also beginning 21 days of prayer, and we'll be here praying and on Friday nights. And Veronica and I will be online every morning at 7 a.m., breaking strongholds with you and digging deeper into some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. But if we are going to fight this battle and do it right, man, we've got to understand something. We've got to become aware. So I need you to see some basic truths about spiritual warfare. Four basic truths about spiritual warfare. Number one is this. There is a spiritual realm. There is more to this life than what we can see naturally and sense physically. If all you see is what you see, then you will never see all there is to be seen. Are y'all still with me? Or are you confused? Okay, are you with me? Everything that is visible, that is visible, that is like physical and visible, it was actually spawned by the invisible and spiritual. There was actually nothing physical that did not begin spiritual. It actually began spiritually and manifested physically. There's nothing just physical. It began spiritual. So if you're going to fix the physical, you got to address the spiritual. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, For we are not fighting. A lot of you would like a period right there and just end that scripture. We're not fighting. Good. There you go. (laughs) No, that's not what it says. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Meaning people are not the source of your problems. They could be the conduit of your problems, but they're not the source of your problems. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in, look what it says, in heavenly places. See, the consequences that we're dealing with in our lives, in our homes, in our culture, we're dealing with them because there's this gap between where God is and where we are. Physical solutions can't fix problems that originate in the spiritual realm. We just have to, you guys got to become aware of this, that there's more to life than what you see with your natural sight. There's more. There is a spiritual realm. Ephesians 1.3 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And look where it is, though. In the what? In the heavenly realms. Because we are united with Christ. He goes on to say that we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. So here's the reality that you need. Check this out. It's going to blow your mind. You exist. If you're a child of God, you actually exist in two realms. You exist in the spiritual realm, but you're also in the spirit realm. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And that place that you're seated, that access point is where your victory comes from. Okay? So when the Bible talks about like heavenly places and heaven and spiritual realm, they're actually three different heavens. The, the word by, in, in, interpreted in your scripture, when you see heaven in the, in the Bible, it actually could mean three different actual places in the, in the spirit realm or the natural realm. Let me show it to you guys, okay? Let me just make sense of this. The first realm that you can see, like, like the first heaven, is earth, the earth heavens. God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 19 is another example of this. It's the sky. It's the, the stars. It's the space. The Bible actually calls that a, a heaven. It's, called, it's the first heaven. But there is a second heaven or a second realm. That's the demonic or the angelic realm. 
That's what we just read, those, the unseen world, the forces of evil in heavenly places. That's where the, the activity of the demonic happens. That's where sometimes we can accidentally open a door from that realm into our realm and reap some consequences. Okay, you all still with me? Okay. The third heaven in the Bible, actually Paul calls it the third heaven, is the kingdom of God. That is the presence of God. That is where you are seated. Check this out. When you fight this battle, you do not fight the enemy from the place of the earth because you're fighting from lower ground. You can only fight the enemy from the high ground of the kingdom. We can't solve second heaven problems with first heaven solutions. We need third heaven authority to solve issues created by the second heaven. Come on, are you all with me? Did I confuse you guys? Are you with me, okay? Are you all with me? Second Corinthians chapter 4, 18 says this. So if that's true, if that's true, man, if there's more to this life than this life, and everything that is like, like seeing comes from unseen stuff, and in everything that is like, like, I need to fix my eyes then. If that's true, then I got to fix my focus. This world becomes then a distraction to the reality of what really is happening and the origination point. If that's true, then we need to fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on where it comes from in the unseen. Since what is unseen is temporary, it's fleeting, it's just here today, gone tomorrow. But what is unseen, that, that, that's eternal. I know, there, there is a, look, you, there is a spiritual realm we need to become more aware, attuned of, and quit getting distracted by your sight and your senses. Number two, the thing we need to be aware of is that we are involved in a spiritual war. Like it's happening. There's a war happening. Whether you engage with it or not, it's happening. Whether you choose to fight or not, the war's still happening. There is a spiritual war happening. Life is not a playground. It's a battleground. The devil is strategically scheming and devising a way to destroy you. He's working at it right now. You say, I don't believe that. It don't matter. He's still working. All right? And, and in fact, you'll become a casualty if you don't realize there's a war going on right now. Or you'll fight the wrong battles because God put inside of you, as a child of God, you were created to take dominion. You are created, the spirit of the living God inside of you has authority and has, is given to you to go advance and take dominion. So if you don't actually fight this battle, you'll fight the wrong battles. If you don't take dominion over the right things, you'll try to take dominion over the wrong things, namely people. You'll try to dominate people. You try to dominate things. You try to dominate commerce. You try to dominate power and dominate money. And you were not created to dominate in this world, but to dominate in kingdom. Okay, so, so you were created for this. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9 says, be self-controlled and alert. He's saying, hey, church, wake up, wake up. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Now, no lion comes out in the open and announces to its prey, hey, I'm about to take a bite out of your midsection. No, he stays, he lies in cover, right, and waits for the opportune time to pounce on his prey. He's looking for someone to devour. So don't just, you know, sit back there and for goodness, act like it's not happening. And for goodness sake, don't act like you're scared. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. Stand firm in the faith. And I'm going to teach you how in this series. But you need to realize there is an enemy lying in cover. There's a spiritual warfare dynamic happening right now. Now let me tell you what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that there is a devil behind every problem and a demon under every rock. You run out of gas, and you're like, it was the Chevron demon. Dang it, it's in my car. I rebuked the Chevron demon. No, you just forgot to go to the gas station, bro. Stop it, okay? So not every problem and habit and issue comes from a demon, okay? I personally believe, though, there's a lot more going on spiritually than we know. I think a lot of what's going on in America right now is more spiritual than it is natural. And I think there's a lot of people, because there is a, there is a category of people that maybe overdo it and overfocus on it. But for a lot of you, that's not the problem. The problem is you've actually let that minority people stop you from even fighting the battle. You don't even fight now, engage. And so the enemy has got you not even engaging because of a minor, the, the minority of people that just overdo it, okay? So here's my definition of spiritual warfare. When we talk about spiritual warfare, what is it? What is the war that we're fighting even? Here it is. Write this down. It's the fight to believe and obey God's truths. 
over the enemy's lies. That is the battle. It is a battle of truth versus lies. It's a battle in your mind. It's a battle of your thoughts. It's a battle to believe and obey what God says over what the enemy says. 2 Corinthians 10 says it like this. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the nature of this world, our flesh and what we can feel and see. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments. So these are our conversations and lies and deceptions and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to obey Christ. Strongholds, as described in Scripture, it's an imag- imagination, reasoning, a thought pattern, a mindset a paradigm or a way of thinking that gets so engraved so deep in us, it becomes part of us. A stronghold will affect how you think. And how you think will affect how you feel. And how you feel affects how you behave. And how you behave creates a pattern in our life. Strongholds in, in the Greek, it literally means, literally means any lie of the devil that keeps you trapped. Any lie that goes against the word of God But just by believing of it, it can become a reality in your life. He says we demolish those things. That word demolish, it means to violently cast down. This isn't a passive thing. I know some of you love your kumbaya Christianity, but the Bible says buckle up. No, you don't get it because you were promised. You get it because you fought for it. You got to take dominion over it, okay? Because the enemy, he he ain't playing the game you're playing, the pretend game. No, 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 he's coming to fight, Okay? So there's a lot of confusion about this. There really is. And there's a lot of even theological people on different sides of what the spiritual war is and what it looks like and deliverance and, and, and what deliverance is. And so let me kind of set some theological understanding about this some more, okay? We got to understand, believers need deliverance from strongholds. Unbelievers need deliverance from demons, okay? I, I, If you are a child of God, a believer in Christ, and you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there is no demon that can cohabitate the dwelling of God. No, no demon, okay? So, so look, but there is, you can relinquish territory that God has promised you of your life, that he is possessing, and you're like, he ain't possessing you, but he's possessing areas, strongholds in your life that you have surrendered to him. Believers need deliverance from the strongholds where the enemy has grabbed hold of things in our life, not of, not of actual demons, okay? Everything is not a demon just because there's an, there's an addiction or there's a problem or there's a challenge. Everything ain't a demon, Okay? And this is, this is a side, I just need to set some theolo- theology right here. In the Garden of Eden, when, the, when, when Satan came and tempted and deceived uh, uh, Adam and Eve, by the way, that was spiritual warfare. The enemy came and tempted, that was warfare. But, but God didn't come and have to rebuke the devil out of e- Eve and Adam. No, it was, it was, but it was warfare. When, when Peter tells Jesus, you know, that's not going to happen to you. You're not going to be crucified. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. He didn't, he didn't go, and I rebuked the devil out of you, Satan. No, no, no. He's, he's, well, he wasn't in field with the, but it was a stronghold that he actually gave territory to the enemy. Are you guys seeing this, you guys? So, so in Romans, Paul tells the Roman church, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by changing the way you think. That this is how, as followers of Jesus, this is the battle. It's by renewing and transforming our mind. He didn't say be transformed by casting out every evil spirit. Okay, so, so believers, we need deliverance, though, from the strongholds. There are things in our life that we've allowed, we've opened. I'll show you how, the enemy too. But unbelievers, there's not even spiritual warfare, by the way, for unbelievers. It's not a war. They're under the power of the devil. They can't fight. They're not, they don't have the blood of Jesus. They don't have, they, they, they have no grand, ground. They're actually under the demonic realm. That's it. But for believers, look, they might have access, but you have authority. I'm preaching better than you're responding again, but I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says it like this. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So here's what I want to do today. 
as we go on this journey together. I, I, I want us to become more aware of the schemes and the strategy of the enemy in spiritual warfare. Because you, in order to fight this battle, you, and not fight the wrong battles or on the wrong battlefield, you, gotta, you can't let him outwit you. You need to be aware of his scheme. So, so there's actually three, three main battlefronts that I want to talk to you about today. Three main different, different, it's all spiritual warfare, but there's different battle fronts that he will come and attack. That scripturally we see there are three battle fronts to spiritual warfare. Here they are, write them down. Number one is this. The first is the demonic battle front. Yeah, everybody, it's not just costumes in Halloween. Those, they're real. And, and by the way, almost 60% of Christian, the Christian population in America think, oh no, the devil's a symbol. Oh, no, demons are just symbols, you know, it's not, not a real thing. 60% of Americans uh, that are Christian. Well, if I was the devil, I'd want you to think that too. You know what I'm saying? Because you won't actively fight something that you don't think is real. And that's the truth. You know, if a thief wanted to rob you, he ain't going to come knock on your door and be like, hey, guys, I'll be around around 11.30 p.m., you know, when you guys are sleeping. You know, if you can leave the door unlocked for me, it may be like a lot easier. No, no, that's not what he does, right? His whole ploy is he doesn't want you to know. Listen to me. You need to know. You need to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the truth is you got an enemy. And let me tell you this about this enemy of yours. You got to understand this and how doors even get open. The enemy operates through legal access. Or, or, or write down open doors by that. Legal access, where you, where you legally give right for the enemy to, uh, through open door. A lot of you know when you open the door of your house, the flies start flying in, the mosquitoes start flying in. How many of you know what I'm talking about? They're all waiting right there by the porch and stuff. So when the kids open the door and they leave it, they're like, close the door, close the door, close the door. Oh my God, close the door, right? You know what I'm talking about? The flies come swarming in and stuff. You're, it doesn't matter if you rent the home or you own the home. It, it doesn't matter. Those creatures will trespass and enter that place if you open the door for them. The enemy, if you open the door, will come in because you opened it to him. Here's the reality, though. Satan has already been defeated. And you need to understand this about this demonic realm. Satan is a defeated foe. Does he have power? Absolutely. But he is a defeated foe. Colossians chapter 2.15 says it like this, that God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers, look what it says, of their authority so look they yeah they got access i open the door they have access but they don't have authority when the cross with the cross he won the victory and showed the world that they were powerless wait a second so if they're powerless if they don't have authority then why in the world are they possessing things and in my in my house when they don't belong here how does that happen here listen if hell is operating in your life it's because you gave them permission to do so the enemy was told either by your participation in sin or circumstances that you were willing to yield things of your life to his control to his dominion you said, hell, it's okay if you control my mind. I won't think God's thoughts. I'll entertain those thoughts. Hell, it's okay for you to control my emotions. It's okay for you to control my will or my body. I give you, I give you permission to tell me I'm not a man when I was born a male. I give you permission to tell me I'm not a woman when I was born a female. I give you permission to tell me that I want drugs, I need drugs, I can't stop using drugs. I give you permission to tell me I need a drink when I wake up, when I go to bed, I can't go to sleep without it. I give you permission to tell me that I should wake up depressed, stay depressed, go to bed depressed. I give you permission to tell me I can't control my anger and I can't stop spending and I can't control my desires and I'm never going to be loved and amount to anything. Hell, I give you permission. I'll accept those thoughts when we open the door of our lives to the demonic realm how do we do that by the way well you do that in a number of ways you give legal points of access and open door you 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 he's gonna he's gonna harass how do we do that well you can do it through unforgiveness unforgiveness is an open door to demonic realm childhood wounds and rejections that are still not Heal. There's ungodly soul ties. There's occult practices. There's committing even sins. Committing sins opens the door to the demonic realm. Generational sins. These things give legal access and open doors. Now, now I, I get asked the question a lot about, about the door of the enemy and, and when is it? Look, you get, child of God, listen to me. 
You cannot be demonized and possessed. You can, you can, they can possess what they're not supposed to, but not you. Are you all with me on that? Every Christian can be harassed, oppressed, attacked by the enemy. You can suffer greatly into his hands. But you really have a lot more to do with that than you understand. Uh, how much the devil is going to take and harass. 1 Peter chapter 5, let me read that again. It says, be self-controlled or be alert and of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because, look what he says, because you know that the family of believers throughout the whole world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Just because I'm a child of God doesn't mean the lion ain't trying to bite me. No, 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 no. I, gotta, I, I still have to resist him. He's still lying in cover waiting for me. He's still trying to steal and kill and destroy. Every person in the family of God is suffering the same things, and you got to be aware of the schemes. So, so when it comes to the demonic, that, that battlefield of demonic, what are the entry points? Let me give you three main entry points of demonic strongholds. I'm going to give you entry points and doors uh, for every battlefield. I'm going to show you guys where it's coming from. We're going to dig into this and study more throughout our devotions in the mornings and in this series. You guys, three main entry points of demonic strongholds. Number one is through inheritance. You can actually inherit demons through your bloodline. Do you know that? You can, you, you, like from one generation to another generation, demons don't die when people die. They get transferred. There are certain proclivities and infirmities that have followed your family line and will continue to follow until someone breaks that generational curse through, through repentance and fellowship with Jesus Christ. We can, we can inherit. Number two, we can, we can, uh, an entry point of demonic stronghold is invasion, where there's just fiery darts of the enemy, man. There's intrusion. How does that happen? Like, a lot of times, like through our childhood, man, like through... When a child grows up in a hostile home or a broken home where there was divorce, when elephants fight, the grass suffers. When two adults are fighting, going through a divorce, the children are caught between that in civil war, and they are opening themselves up to demonic strongholds and spirits and activity in their life. Strongholds of anger and resentment and hatred and, and uh, uh uh, all kinds of stuff we open, or abuse is another door of invasion. When we suffer abuse, the people, the abusers, are already got demons and and strongholds in their life. But when you suffer abuse, it is a it is an intrusive form of spiritual warfare, where we open the door to demonic strongholds, um, where Satan exploits those weak places and weak moments to gain mastery over our lives through the, the demonic strongholds through inheritance, through invasion. Number three is through involvement. Like involvement in, in like occult practices and in witchcraft or horoscopes or fortune telling or palm reading and those, those things that we open our life to, we go to, we give access to the spirit, the demonic realm. When we go to those things instead of going to the spirit and the word of God, you open yourself to demonic strongholds. Keep the doors of your life closed and the flies and the mosquitoes will stay out, Okay. There's just some, the, the, the first entry point is demonic. The first battlefield, sorry, is demonic. The second battlefield, biblically that we see, theologically, the second battlefield is the world or the world system, is another battlefield of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare happens through this world system that we live in. Here's what 1 John chapter 2 kind of explains it. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world... Love for the Father isn't in them. He's talking about the world system, not the people in the world, but the world system. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world system that the enemy is actually behind and operating. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So this is another battlefront of spiritual warfare, the system of this world that we see, we can, tell, we can tell, a lot of you have discernment, you can tell something's not right with the culture, with the system. Something's, something's behind this. Something is trying to confuse and distort and deceive 
and, and, and divide. So what are the doors of worldly strongholds? You can throw them all up, all three doors of the worldly strongholds. He says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Well, what is that? What is that? Well, the lust of the flesh is sensualism. Can you see that in our culture, you guys? Over-sensualization and sexualization, it's everywhere. It's not just like a physical thing. No, 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 that's a spiritual war that is happening. The lust of the eyes. How about materialism? Do you see that kind of in our culture? Materialism. So that need for more, got to get more, more, upgrade, upgrade. Yeah, you thought that was just natural, right? That you wanted, like, like you just got the new thing, and just like months later, the new thing's not satisfying, and you want the other thing? Oh, you thought that was natural. That was just natural. No, 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 that's spiritual. That is a spiritual war happening. Where is it happening? On the battle of the world system. Or, or the pride of life, that egotism. That, that propping oneself up, projecting oneself as something that you're, that you're not, that egotism. These are, these, are battle, these are just open doors to the battlefield of the worldly system. And then this, this third battlefront of spiritual warfare is actually the one that you're probably most familiar with because you're sitting in the, you're, you're in it and it's your flesh, okay? So you know the battle of your flesh pretty well because you know your habits and your issues and things that are happening. So we are more acutely aware with this battle than probably the other battles, but let me help kind of shed some light even on this battlefield of the flesh. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which, look what it says, wage war against your soul. So this is a battlefield, man. My, my, my carnal nature, my flesh nature, those, those, the, that actually is more than just physical. It's actually a spiritual battle that's happening. So let me give you the four stages of carnal strongholds. Man, I told you I had a lot to go over with you guys, man. I'm just helping you become more aware of the battle that's going on so that we can fight the right ones. Amen, somebody? Four stages. This actually comes from James chapter 1, if you want to read it later in James chapter 1. Verse 14 and 15, he says, when each person is tempted, he's dragged away by his own evil desires. And after desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, he says, give birth to death. So the first stage of our carnal strongholds is desire. Desire. Now, desire in itself is not wrong. Legitimate desires motivate us in our lives. But when desire or lust manifests itself through illegitimate means, it turns into temptation giving potential to sin. So desire for food is good, but gluttony is a sin. Desire for sex is good, but immorality is a sin. Desire for sleep is good, but laziness is a sin. See, Satan's initial strategic point in our lives is to play on the legitimate God-given desires within us, and then he twists it into something illegitimate, illegitimate and extreme. Essentially, he wants the desires to have mastery over us instead of us to have mastery over the desire. So it always begins with desire, but the second stage in Satan's strategy is deception. Uh, a good illustration of this is how a fisherman sets out to catch a fish. Now, a fisherman, when he, when he sets the, the hook in the water, if he sets it out without any bait, without any worm on it, he's probably going to be waiting a long time, isn't he? Probably, probably never. There's nothing going to bite on that thing, okay? But a good fisherman is going to put a worm on that thing, or in fact, the right bait to catch the right fish is what he's going to use. Satan doesn't just simply throw unbaited hooks at us. He doesn't advertise that if you continue to watch pornography, you're going to distort and confuse your identity and masculinity and your, your ability to have intimacy. He doesn't advertise that. He says, sex is good. Don't you want sex? It's legitimate. Sex is good. In fact, you, maybe you didn't know that, but they've done scientific studies on this now, like the science to back it up now, that if you continue, if you habitually, if you expose yourself to, to pornography too long, then you actually can confuse your masculinity and femininity. What a, what, what a no, he doesn't come out and tell you that. It's, he, he's going he's gonna to use deception. He's going to bait that hook. He uses the foot in the door technique. Y'all get you, do you guys get those door knockers and you're like trying to sell you something, you know what I mean? Th that's what the technique comes from, the salespeople. The foot in the door technique is where when they get a foot in the door, they start talking to you about something that has nothing to do with what they're selling you. 
You know, they're talking to you about sports or your kids or something else, but they know, oh, got the foot in the door. Now, after talking about this, I can come and get them with the sale, my pitch. It's coming, okay? That's how the enemy operates. He operates by that foot in the door technique. He just wants a foot in the door. But after deception, the third stage is disobedience. Desire leads to deception. Deception leads to disobedience. Desire is not the sin. Sin is the application of the desire. Now, I don't show you this so that you'll try harder where you go, man, I need to just be better and do better and I need to just obey. No, the battle's not in your efforts. The battle is in believing God's truth. See, the opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is disobedience. Because if you believe God, if you believed his truth, you wouldn't fall for the enemy's lies. Like if you really believe God, for instance, he says in his word, God says, in the same measure that you forgive others, you will be forgiven. That if you do not forgive others, your heavenly father will not forgive you. If you truly believe that, you would stop holding on to that offense and let that person go. If you really believe that, you wouldn't buy the deception of the enemy that says you deserve to be bitter and to be offended and how dare they and they should. You would not buy that. You would not bite that hook, not for one minute, if you knew your forgiveness was hanging on the line of that hook. Okay, so, so faith, faith is not a matter about trying or disobedience. That's actually just the opposite of faith. It, it, the battle is not in doing, it's in believing. I got to believe God's truth, not in the enemy's lies. And that disobedience leads to that fourth stage, James says, is death. Satan's intention in spiritual warfare is to cause us to miss out on the goodness of God, to, to, to lead us to our destruction. Sin produces death in a variety of ways that keeps us from, from experiencing God's promise of an abundant life. We can experience death in our emotions death in our, in our marriages and relationships, death in our future or our businesses, or you can experience death in a lot of ways, but the primary death it brings is the death of our spirits as our fellowship with God is broken. See, breaking fellowship with God is what makes us ineffective as believers. Who, it's only as we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. That's the only place that I am effective as a follower of Christ. That's all my resources are in heavenly realms. Every spiritual blessing is seated in Christ. It's hidden in heavenly realms. And if he can get you out of that seat, he can get you. He can start to possess things he doesn't, he actually doesn't have a right to in your life. Here's the final truth. I hope you're getting something out of this. Are y'all y'all getting something out of this today? Okay. Here's here's the final truth. You need to know about spiritual warfare as we begin this journey together, and that is the enemy is subject to our God. Can I get a better amen, somebody? He actually trembles at our God. He he already had one fight with God, and it lasted a millisecond. You know what I mean? Jesus said, "I saw him fall like lightning." You know what that means? It means like the moment that. God decided to, the Father decided to deal with Satan with the pride that was found in his heart. It wasn't a big cosmic battle of good versus evil that people think, you know, in their mind, they're like, oh, evil's winning, and then God's winning, and they're just like, no, it was like lightning. Jesus said, when God wanted to deal with it, it happened like this, bam, that's it, that's it. In fact, the angels, they saw like lightning before they even heard anything. They saw something, and then they heard, and they're like, what in the world just happened right now? That, look, he is subject to our God. And when you align yourself with God, then you become just as victorious as him over the devil. That's why the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, you dear children, listen to discovery, listen, listen. You are from God. And you have, say that word out loud, you have overcome them. You're an overcomer, church. You need to know that. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Now you, you, you're not so great. Me, I'm not so great. But the one who's in me is greater than he who's in the world. So, so as we go on this journey of, of, of not being indifferent to the reality of a war that's happening, of, of, of starting to access the things that God has actually promised us, of becoming so much more aware than just our 
physical sight as we start this journey, you guys, of taking hold of the, what the enemy has taken from us. I think the first, the first step here is just not awareness, but it's James chapter 4, verse 7. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves. Okay, hey, if this is true, we got a war going on, and the enemy's trying to bring, you know, confuse our desires and deceive us and, and disobedience and death. Hey, okay, if that's true, submit yourselves then to God. He's the one who has the power. He's the one who has authority. He's the one who has every spiritual blessing hidden in heavenly realms. Submit yourselves then to God and resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. As we begin this journey, this is just like, it's more than just the information and being aware today, this is what I'd like to lead us to, the first step that we need to take. We just need to submit to God's truth. Instead of the enemy's lies that we've been believing and opening ourselves up to and opening the doors, entry points in our life, because we, ultimately the reality is, I'm not diminishing the reality of the, the, the challenges and the hurts and the pains reality is the battle is we didn't believe God's truth we need to submit to God and resist him and he'll flee and I believe we're going to see that happen today and over the next four weeks together in Jesus name hey thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel don't stop here join the Discovery online family every Sunday subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.